Hello, welcome. It is time to sign off your Netflix, get out of HBO Go, turn off your Twitter, and jump on board the subject matter jurisdiction train because we are going to talk about federal subject matter jurisdiction um, in this online class. So welcome. Okay, we're going to with some vocabulary. So basically the idea of subject matter jurisdiction is that we're sorting cases between court systems, trying to figure out the most uh, efficient way to handle cases before the courts that are best equipped to handle them. So here's some basic vocabulary. When we say a court has exclusive jurisdiction, it means that only that one particular court can host the case. Other court can. When we say courts have concurrent jurisdiction, it means that there are two or more courts that could host the case, and plaintiff then gets to make a choice about which court they want to file the case in. When we say a court has limited jurisdiction, it means that courts may that court may only hear certain kinds of cases. Um, spoiler alert, federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, and that's why we spend so much time worrying about what cases can be filed in federal court. And when we say a court has general subject matter jurisdiction, it means that the court may hear any type of case except those that are assigned exclusively to other courts. So it's kind of a catch-all uh, category of, juris of subject matter jurisdiction. Um, and most state courts have at least one court of general subject matter jurisdiction. Okay. So when we talk about subject matter jurisdiction, what is it we're talking about? We're referring to the power of the court over the kind of case that's in front of it. Now note this is not talking about power over the parties. That's personal jurisdiction. And as you, I'm sure, recall uh, with great fondness, we spent quite a bit of time talking about that um, a few weeks ago in class. So, as to subject matter jurisdiction then, states can arrange their court systems however they want to. Uh, so state legislatures will typically design their court systems for the state uh, in a way that, that seems most efficient, right? After all, we're talking about using tax dollars here. So what do you think goes into the decisions to divide cases amongst particular courts within a state? Well, mostly we're talking about efficiency. So it might be cheaper and more efficient to say that all the cases having to do with small claims are going to be um, in a particular court with very informal procedures and we're going to let those courts handle claims that are um, relatively inexpensive, say up to $2,500 or $3,000 or whatever amount the legislature picks. And so what they're trying to do with this is manage the caseloads of the various courts within the system so that no one court gets overloaded. Okay, and then there's also a concern about expertise. Sometimes states will say, okay, we're going to take all our cases that have to do with probate or family law and we're going to channel them into one particular court. That way we know the judges in that court will develop an expertise and that will then be uh, more efficient over the long run because those judges will not have to reinvent the wheel every time. They'll know all the, how the cases should go, etc. States typically, as I mentioned earlier, also have at least one court of general jurisdiction, sort of a catch-all court. The idea being that that court can hear whatever case attorneys can dream up to bring under the common law or under statutes and uh, they don't have limits as to their jurisdiction. 
Now be careful here because as you may have noticed, this term general jurisdiction has surfaced before in our studies when we talked about personal jurisdiction. General personal jurisdiction and general subject matter jurisdiction are completely separate things despite the similarity of their names. General personal jurisdiction, as I know you guys all know, uh, refers to the power of a court where somebody's domiciled or where a corporation's incorporated or has its principal place of business or does continuous and systematic business um, to have power over that person or that corporation in any case, no matter when. On the subject matter side, we're talking about the, that particular court having power over uh, any kind of case that somebody can dream up to bring. So on the personal jurisdiction side, it's about power over the defendant. On the subject matter jurisdiction side, it's about power over the case. Okay. Here's the interesting, fascinating, wonderful thing about our system in the United States. We also, in addition to our state court systems, have federal courts uh, that are, by definition, courts of limited jurisdiction. We're going to talk a lot about why they're limited and how to know when you're able to bring your case in federal court. But for now, just note and never forget that federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. Okay, before we move on into the details of uh, when courts have power over the subject matter, let's compare subject matter jurisdiction to personal jurisdiction. And the first and most important thing to know about this is that when you're choosing a court to bring your lawsuit in, you got to pick a court with both personal jurisdiction over the defendant and subject matter jurisdiction over the case. So, that's because personal jurisdiction protects defendants. Personal jurisdiction is focused on defendants. And it protects defendants in both state and federal court, which are located in a given state, because defendants have due process rights not to be bound by a judgment rendered by a court unless that court has power over that defendant. So remember our constitutional superhero, the Due Process Clause, that protects defendants. Okay, so that means that defendants can waive objections to personal jurisdiction if they want to. It's their rights. They can do whatever they want with them. They can waive by consenting. They can waive by failing to object. The rights belong to the defendant when it comes to personal jurisdiction. By contrast, subject matter jurisdiction protects the courts themselves, not the defendants. And the courts, of course, are arms of the sovereigns they're part of. So the courts of Arizona are part of the sovereign of the state of Arizona. The federal district courts are part of the sovereign of the federal government. So subject matter jurisdiction is supposed to protect the courts themselves, not the defendants. So that means defendants cannot waive objections to subject matter jurisdiction ever. They cannot waive by consent. They cannot waive by failing to object. They just cannot waive. OK. The forum shopping trifecta. That's kind of fun to say. Say it with me. Trifecta. OK, so when you're choosing a court to file your lawsuit in, you have to choose a court that has all three of these important procedural aspects. The court has to have subject matter jurisdiction, and the court has to have personal jurisdiction, and the court has to have proper venue. So if you look at this Venn diagram here, the courts that are actually available for filing a suit in are the ones where subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction and venue all intersect. That center part of the Venn diagram. 
All right, let's test what we know so far. So, Dooley, as is typical of Dooley, slips and falls in a Walmart located in Phoenix, Arizona, and wants to sue Walmart. Question. Is Walmart subject to personal jurisdiction in all the courts located in Arizona? Now you guys are experts on this now, right? And you know that that's quite a complicated question. You know that in order for Walmart, which is a corporation incorporated in Delaware with its principal place of business in Arkansas, to be subject to personal jurisdiction in Arizona, there would have to be minimum contacts between Walmart and Arizona. Well, lucky for Dooley, there are, right? And there are related contacts in the sense that Walmart's operating the store in Arizona where Dooley slipped and fell. And that's what Dooley's case is about. So specific jurisdiction definitely exists in um, Arizona using all those minimum contacts factors that we've talked about before. Purposeful availment, state interest, and convenience. Okay. So that answers the personal jurisdiction question. Walmart is subject to personal jurisdiction in all courts that are located in Arizona. Now let's talk about the subject matter jurisdiction question. Can Dooley sue in the state courts of Arizona? Yes. State courts are courts of general subject matter jurisdiction. If Dooley has a claim under tort law, then yes, the state courts of Arizona will entertain that claim. Okay, but here's the next question. Can Dooley sue in the federal court located in Arizona? Well, maybe. That depends. Because federal courts are courts of limited subject matter jurisdiction. That means they can only hear certain kinds of cases. And that's what we have to really grapple with. And this is something that the bar tests heavily on. How do you know when you can file a case in federal court? All right, before we get into the details of how you know when you can file a case in federal court, let's just talk about some interesting features of subject matter jurisdiction, the idea. The idea of the court having power over the kind of case. And by the way, if this kind of thing interests you, yeah, you might be a nerd. Sort of like you might be a redneck if. This is you might be a nerd if these features of subject matter jurisdiction uh, actually <laughs> interest you. But they do me, so there you go. All right, first, parties cannot waive objections to subject matter jurisdiction. Why not? Pause, pause, pause for you to answer that question. Right, exactly, because subject matter jurisdiction is supposed to protect the courts themselves, not parties. So parties cannot waive. And in fact, that means that courts are so concerned about their own subject matter jurisdiction that they will check it regularly sua sponte, which is just a fancy Latin way of saying on its own. The court on its own will check whether it has subject matter jurisdiction without even waiting for one of the parties to say, hey, wait a minute, you don't have subject matter jurisdiction. Um, the courts will check it on their own. Did you see this happen in your reading? If you've read Motley, the famous Motley case, and you saw it happen. The court itself, the U.S. Supreme Court, no less, notices that there's a lack of subject matter jurisdiction and dismisses the case on that basis. If a case is dismissed for a lack of subject matter jurisdiction then, uh, in federal court, then plaintiff can refile the case in state court. So think about this for a second. If a case gets thrown out of federal court because it was filed in the wrong place, there was no power in federal court over that kind of case, it doesn't mean that the plaintiff's claim is bad or terrible or shouldn't be pursued. It just means that plaintiff filed it in the wrong court. 
And so if the federal court dismisses for lack of personal jurisdiction, plaintiff is more than welcome to go to state court where they should have been in the first place and file their case. Oh, that's me, the other Cipro nerd. Okay. So let's say that a case is filed against your client and you think in federal court and you think the court does not have subject matter jurisdiction over the case. What should you do? Well, I wonder if you guys remember the arsenal of weapons that defendants have in cases filed against them in federal court. They're located in Federal Rule 12. Federal Rule 12 is a quiver full of arrows that defendants can point at plaintiff's case to shoot it down before it even gets off the ground. And in particular, Rule 12b1 allows defendants to file a motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And while you're checking out Rule 12, which I hope you are, take a look at 12h which says that certain defenses that a defendant might have are waived if defendant fails to bring them at the beginning of the lawsuit. Is that a concern for subject matter jurisdiction? No. Remember, parties, defendants, can't waive objections to personal jurisdiction because they're supposed to protect the courts themselves. So. Unlike personal jurisdiction, venue, and service objections, which must be filed in the first document a defendant uh, puts before the court, a 12B1 motion may be made at any time, before trial, during trial, even on appeal. And Rule 12H3 makes that explicit. Having fun yet? Woohoo! The answer is yes. Party on Garth, party on Wayne. Okay. So now we're ready to talk about federal courts, courts of limited subject matter jurisdiction, as we've said repeatedly already. Okay, so you gotta start at the beginning. A very good place to start. And here the beginning is the federal constitution, the Constitution of the United States, which grants power to the federal government. Article 1 grants power to Congress, the legislative branch. Article 2 grants power to the executive branch and the president. Article 3 is about the judicial branch, the third branch. So any time any federal court does anything it has to be authorized by Article 3. So here's some of the cool things that Article 3 says and does. And by the way, since you guys are all on your fancy computers, take a look at Article 3. Look it up. Read the Constitution. The Constitution is kind of awesome. Okay. One thing that Article 3 does is create the United States Supreme Court as the co-equal third branch of government, co-equal with the executive branch and the presidency, and the legislative branch, the Congress. Okay. And then here's something that you might not have realized. Article 3 does not create other federal courts other than the U.S. Supreme Court. Kind of weird, right? What it does is say that Congress has a power to create lower federal courts as it sees fit. And then Article 3, Section 2, lists different types of cases that federal courts are allowed to take, are allowed to host, are allowed to hear. And they are, you can look at it, it's a whole list, and it talks about cases involving ambassadors, cases involving disputes between different states themselves, like if Missouri sues Kansas or something like that. But the two 
most important types of cases authorized by Article 3, Section 2 are cases between citizens of different states, which we call diversity jurisdiction, and cases arising under the federal constitution or federal law, which we'll call federal question jurisdiction. So here's the deal. Since Article 3 gives Congress the power to create lower federal courts, but doesn't directly create those courts, you had to wait on Congress to do it. Well, the good news is Congress did it. Congress created a lower federal court system from the beginning of the Republic. It's changed in some uh, of its structure over the 200 plus years, um, but Congress has created lower federal courts. And again, because lower federal courts were optional for Congress, it also requires Congress to pass a law, a statute, that allows these lower federal courts to hear the kinds of cases that the Constitution says they're authorized to hear. Let me say that again. In order for a federal district court, a lower federal court, a federal trial court, to entertain a case, to host a case, Congress has to pass the statute to let that happen. They pass a statute. So that means our project, and this is what we're going to be doing over the last uh, week here, is to figure out when you can start a case in federal court. Hint, hint, it's all about the statutes. It's all about when Congress has said a case can be commenced, started in federal court. So let's be clear what we're talking about here. What level of federal court? talking about federal district courts, the trial court level of the federal system. When can you start a case? When, you can, when can you file a complaint in federal court? Who has to give the power? You guys know the answer. We were just talking about it. There it is. Congress. Your Congress at work for you. You have to have a statute passed by Congress granting power for the case to be heard in federal court. Okay. It's all about the statutes. So when you're studying for this unit, you have to know the statutes. The statutes are the laws passed by Congress allowing cases to be started in federal court. Okay. So here's your Congress at work for you. Woo! Taxpayer dollars at work. Um, okay, so I, the two major uh, categories of jurisdiction I mentioned are diversity and federal question. Okay. Going all the way back to 1789. 1789, very early on in the Republic, Congress created the lower federal courts and gave them what we call diversity jurisdiction, power over cases between parties from different states. I'm going to flesh that out in a minute. But it wasn't until, get this, 1875, almost a hundred years later, that Congress gave lower federal courts federal question jurisdiction, that is power over cases involving federal claims. Isn't that bizarre? It's weird, right? Why is that? Why would you think that federal cases wouldn't be in federal court until 1875? Um, P.S. There was one short-lived experiment with federal court, um, federal question jurisdiction in 1801, um, but it only lasted about six months. It was only in 1875 and onward that federal courts got federal question jurisdiction. 
How can we explain this? All right, let's think history. 1875, 1875. What's going on in 1875? Well, what's just happened in 1875 is, look at these images, the Civil War. The Civil War, right? The Civil War, where the Union Army had fought a bloody, bloody war to preserve the Union and preserve the idea of the federal constitution. And in the aftermath of the Civil War, when many constitutional amendments and federal statutes were passed, it became clear that there needed to be some forum for litigation when people thought their federal rights were not being honored in the states where they lived, particularly in the com former Confederate states. So federal question jurisdiction was passed in 1875 to preserve federal rights and give people a place to go, namely federal court, to preserve those rights and to enforce those rights. Okay, so it's all about the statutes, right? Figuring out when there's federal jurisdiction is all about the statutes. So you got to know the key statutes, and these are the ones that you're going to want to know. You're going to want to know the key features of. Um, there are four. Okay, the first one is the one I just mentioned. 28 U.S.C. Section 1331 grants federal question jurisdiction to federal district courts. 28 U.S.C. Section 1332 grants diversity jurisdiction to federal district courts. 28 U.S.C. Section 1367 grants federal district courts power to hear claims that are supplemental to, that come along with federal question or diversity claims in one case. And then section 1441 is the removal statute. It allows defendants who have been sued in state court in cases that could have been filed by the plaintiffs in federal court to change to federal court to remove the case to federal court even if plaintiffs don't want to. They can say, hey plaintiff, Dude, you sued me in state court, but you could have sued me in federal court. And I prefer federal courts. So guess what? That's where we're going. So those are the four statutes. The federal question statute, the diversity statute, the supplemental jurisdiction statute, 1367, and the removal statute, 1441. Okay, so um, in the next several days, we're going to consider these in some detail. This overview is going to take you through 1331, the Federal Question Statute, and 1332, the Diversity Statute. Okay, as we get into 1331, I want to think about the policy behind it. That is, why do we need Federal Question Jurisdiction? And Let's start with the language of the statute it says, itself. It says that federal district courts have power over cases arising under the federal constitution, statutes, and laws. So sometimes, by the way, this is called arising under jurisdiction, meaning the cases arise under federal law. The more common term, and I think the one that is more descriptive and better, is to say it's federal question jurisdiction. Okay. Why do we need federal question jurisdiction? Let's think about that for a second. Uh, okay. So, if you got a federal statute and somebody's bringing a lawsuit under that federal statute, let's, uh, let's say it, it's supposed to protect their civil rights, for example, and someone brings a lawsuit under that statute. Why would it be better, arguably, 
for that someone to bring the case in federal court versus state court. Again, it's a federal statute. Well, one argument is that we want that federal statute, which governs everyone in the United States, right? It's a federal statute. It's a national statute. We want that to mean the same thing in Maine that it means in Arizona. We want uniformity. We want the interpretation of that federal statute to be the same in Maine as it is in Arizona. So this uniformity idea is more likely to be upheld in federal courts, which are national courts, as opposed to the state courts of Maine and the state courts of Arizona. Expertise. We figure federal judges are probably more expert on issues of federal law than state judges would be. Well, that makes sense, right? State judges are experts on state law. Federal judges are experts on federal law. This is the interesting one. Remember how we said that federal question jurisdiction only happened after the Civil War? Think about what's going on after the Civil War, right? We've got the former Confederate states with now all these obligations under federal civil rights law and, and constitution law, and they're not necessarily into it, right? Those state judges are, uh, might even be hostile to federal law. So it wouldn't be very helpful for someone to go to state court in a post-Civil War Southern state, Confederate state, and argue for their federal rights, right? Judges might be hostile. So the idea is that having access to the federal court for those kinds of cases is more likely to give a meaningful uh, um, remedy to people under federal law. Okay, but here's one thing I want to be very clear about. Having said all that, it doesn't mean that state courts can't hear federal question cases. It's not as though you have to bring a federal question case in federal court. Normally, federal courts and state courts have concurrent jurisdiction over federal questions. Remember our vocabulary from earlier? If there's concurrent jurisdiction, plaintiffs get a choice. They can choose federal court or they can choose state court. Unless Congress has made federal question jurisdiction exclusive, meaning you can only bring it in federal court, then a case making a federal claim can be brought in either federal or state court. And there aren't that many, maybe surprisingly, there aren't that many kinds of cases that are exclusively federal. Some um, really common examples of exclusively federal cases are bankruptcy. Bankruptcy has to be filed in federal court. Uh, and, and in fact, there's a special federal bankruptcy court. Um, some kinds of patent and copyright cases. Um, shout out to Professor Fordham. Um, are exclusively federal. Some aren't, though. Um, there are some kinds of securities cases involving corporate um, securities laws that are exclusively federal. And some antitrust laws are exclusively federal. But in general, most federal kinds, federal claims, most federal claims um, can be brought in either state or federal court. And when there's a choice of courts, what can plaintiffs do? I hear you all shouting, forum shop. That's right. OK. The Motley case. So if you haven't yet, you must immediately read the case of the Motleys. I believe the gentleman's name was Erasmus, Erasmus Motley. What a great name. Anyway. Let's go through the Motley case and see why it's important. OK. So we're going to Iraq this bad boy. We could start with the facts. The Motleys had been in a train accident. So they had a tort case against the train company for injury. And they settled it. And for their settlement, they got passes from the train company that allowed them to ride the trains for free for the rest of their lives. Nice, right? Okay. And 
they were happy with this. Everybody's going along just fine, and they're riding the train for free. And then one day the train company says, Hey, Motley's, we're not going to honor your free passes anymore. And the Motley's like, What gives? Why not? And the train company's like, Well, because those folks in Washington have said that we're not allowed to honor free train passes anymore. By the way, the backstory of that, as your book explains, is that there was some concern that train companies were, uh, what's the right word for this? Um, okay, I think the word is bribe, bribing public officials by giving them free train passes. So Congress said, you can't give tr free train passes anymore. Okay, so the Motley sue the train company saying, hey, we settled our case in exchange for free train passes and you're not honoring the free rides anymore. So we want you to do that. And the train company says, well, we can't do that anymore because Congress in Washington has said that we can't. And the issue in the case is this. Well, let me back up and say a few more things. So this case goes all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, they thought, was taking the case to decide whether or not the train company had to honor the Motley's free passes. But the United States Supreme Court ends up saying, hey, we're not even going to talk about that. We're not even going to look at whether or not they have to honor the free passes because we're worried that this case never should have been in federal court to start with. And here's the issue. Does the federal district court, that's the trial level court of the federal system, have power over a case between non-diverse citizens like the Motley's and the train company when the federal issue in the case arises only as a defense by the train company? And in Motley, the Supreme Court announces this rule. The federal district court has federal question jurisdiction only over cases in which the federal issue is part of plaintiff's well-pleaded complaint. The analysis of the case is this. Here, the Motley's complaint, the plaintiff's complaint, is for breach of contract. The Motley's were suing, remember, to say, hey, train company, you promised to give us free rides, and you're not giving us free rides. You've breached your contract. And the train company had said, yeah, that's right, but we breached your contract only because Congress said we had to as a matter of federal law. So the federal issue in the case only came up by way of defendant's de defense. It only comes up if and when the defendant says they breached the contract because federal law required them to do so. And the Supreme Court says that's not good enough for federal jurisdiction. In other words, there's no federal jurisdiction when the federal issue comes up only by way of the defendant's defense. This has come to be known as the Motley well-pleaded complaint rule. And here's how you can state this rule. In order to start a case in a federal district court, the federal trial court, based on federal question jurisdiction, the federal issue must be part of a plaintiff's well-pleaded complaint. If the federal issue comes up only as a defense, there's no federal question jurisdiction. Okay, here's the thing, guys. This is really important to remember. What the Supreme Court is doing in Motley is interpreting 28 U.S.C. section 1331. That language that says the case must arise under the federal constitution. And here's what's beautifully complicated and weird. 
the language in, in the statute, Section 1331, is modeled on what's in the federal constitution. It's almost verbatim. But what's in the constitution is interpreted much more broadly. How do we know that? Well, let's look at the subsequent history of Motley. Okay, so let's let's just recap what we know. Heady stuff, I know. Let's all like take a second, get all zen, and figure this out. All right. So remember the Motleys had started their case in federal district court suing the railroad company for breach of contract. That's a state law claim, a regular old breach of contract claim. The railroad had said, okay, we breached your contract because federal law said we had to. So the federal issue came up when the defendants, the, the uh, railroad company, raised it as a defense. The U.S. Supreme Court says that's not good enough for federal jurisdiction to exist. They shouldn't have been in federal court because the Motley's well-pleaded complaint was a breach of contract claim. A state law claim doesn't belong in federal court. We're kicking you out. We're kicking you out, Motley's, from federal court. Okay. So remember when we talked about when you get kicked out of a court for subject matter jurisdiction, that means you can go to whatever other court does have subject matter jurisdiction and that's exactly what the Motley's did. They started the whole thing over in the state courts. And in the state court the Motley's again argue, hey railroad company you breached your contract to give us free rides. And the defendants once again say yeah we had to because the feds Congress told us we had to. So sure enough, the case turns on this federal defense that the railroad company raises. And then the case ultimately ends up back where? You guessed it, the United States Supreme Court. So the United States Supreme Court can hear the appeal out of the state court system because it ultimately turns on this federal defense. So here's the deal, and this is complicated, I know. And if you're in a turkey coma, my sympathies. But anyway, here's the deal. Motley is saying that there's a difference between the constitutional language about when there's a, a federal question arising under federal law and the question of when you can start a case in the federal district court under section 1331. 1331 is narrower, it's harder to satisfy. The constitutional language is broader and that's why the Supreme Court could take the case on appeal the second time around. So. That means the U.S. Supreme Court is not bound by 1331. It only governs what federal district courts can hear, what, what cases can be started in a federal district court. But the Supreme Court can hear the appeal when it comes back up through the state court system uh, the second time around. Okay. Whew. I'm making myself a little dizzy here with this stuff. This is heady stuff. Um, yeah, even I can be that nerdy. Here's the good news. Given everything we just said and all that complicated um, theory about who can hear what case, here's the good news. The basic Motley rule is, is actually pretty simple and straightforward. In order to start a case in federal district court, the federal issue must be part of plaintiff's claim as revealed in her well-pleaded complaint. And the vast majority of the time, that means the plaintiff is suing because federal law has created the plaintiff's right to sue. So I have here, this is the Holmes creation test. Holmes refers to the very, very famous 
a Supreme Court justice named Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was on the Massachusetts Supreme Court in the late 1800s. He was actually a Civil War veteran, incredible guy. He was on the Massachusetts Supreme Court for a long time, and then he was on the U.S. Supreme Court for a long time, lived into his 90s. He said that you can sue in federal court when federal court creates the right to sue. And this has come to be known as the Holmes Creation Test. And there are many examples of when federal law has created the right for a plaintiff to sue a defendant. For example, Title VII is a federal law that says if you're discriminated against in your job on the basis of your gender or your race, you may sue in federal court. Some federal environmental statutes say um, if you're injured by polluting water or polluting air, there's the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, etc., um, that say you have the right to sue in federal court. There's a thing called a Federal Tort Claims Act that says if you're injured by someone who's um, who's a contractor of the federal government, is the federal government, you have the right to sue in federal court. And there are many others like that. So that's the good news. Usually it's really clear and straightforward that you can sue in federal court because federal law has created the right to sue. The bad news is there are a few marginal cases um, that are harder than that, but I don't want to get bogged down in that. Instead, let's just again recap the Motley well-pleaded complaint rule. In order to start a case in federal court, Based on federal question jurisdiction, the federal issue must be part of plaintiff's well-pleaded complaint. If the federal issue comes up only as a defense, no federal question jurisdiction. Okay, time for you to participate. Woo! So here's what I want you to do. Take out a piece of paper, and I want you to answer a few questions. We're going into hypo hell. And I want you to a answer just a few questions based on what we've just talked about with regard to federal question jurisdiction. Write them on the piece of paper. Um, bring that piece of paper with you to class. And um, we're going to have this hypo hell, one more hypo hell later, and then a quick short essay that I want you to do. Okay. So, question one. Plaintiff from Arizona sues defendant from Arizona for violating plaintiff's federal copyright. Is there federal question jurisdiction? Plaintiff has a federal copyright and is suing for infringement of that copyright. Federal question jurisdiction, you can answer this yes or no. Number two. Plaintiff from Arizona sues defendant from Arizona for running plaintiff over with his car, which is a tort claim under state law. Can plaintiff bring this case under federal question jurisdiction in federal court? Yes or no? Number three. Plaintiff from Arizona sues defendant from Arizona for slander. You guys are experts on this. For telling plaintiff's boss the plaintiff is a spy knowing that defendant will argue he had a right to do so because of a federal whistleblowing statute. So plaintiff is suing for slander, that's a state tort case, and defendant raises a defense based on a federal whistleblowing statute. Can that case be started in federal court under federal question jurisdiction? Yes or no? Okay. Now we're going to move on to the second major category of federal jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction. Now you guys use this when you did your uh, complaints, so it's not altogether unfamiliar, right? All right. There are two basic requirements under the, under the diversity statute, which is at 28 U.S.C. 1332. The two basic requirements are 
there must be complete diversity, meaning everyone who is a plaintiff must be from a different state than everyone who's a defendant. So to be clear, plaintiffs can be from the same state as each other if there's more than one, but all of them have to be from a different state from every defendant. And the amount in controversy in the case must exceed $75,000. All right, so why do we even have this weird thing called diversity jurisdiction? Because by definition, think about it by definition, diversity jurisdiction is going to be in a case based on state law, right? Because if it was a case based on federal law, it would be, right, federal question jurisdiction. So why do we even have such a thing? Well, I uh, went out of my comfort zone and tried to figure this out using a sports analogy. So if you have... Michael Jordan suing Charles Barkley okay if Michael Jordan sues Charles Barkley in the state courts of Illinois where Michael Jordan is uh, what, how do I say close to godlike right do you think Charles Barkley might be a little nervous about that that he's not going to get quite the fair shake so diversity jurisdiction um, means that the out-of-stater can get access to a federal forum so that they don't have to worry about bias against them in the state courts. So in other words, nobody gets the home court advantage, get it, right? So if you look at the diversity statute, which you should be doing right now, pull it up. It's 28 U.S.C. section 1332. And it talks about jurisdiction over cases involving citizens from different states. All right. Then you have to say, okay, well, how do I figure out where I'm a citizen? Well, here's the good news. When you're talking about citizenship for individuals, this is a concept you're already familiar with. The idea is you're a citizen in your home base, your domicile. And you guys know already that the definition of domicile is presence plus intent to remain indefinitely. And you keep one domicile until you acquire a new one by being present somewhere else with the intent to remain there indefinitely. For corporate, oh, sorry, yeah, I just said that. Keep old domicile until you acquire a new one, which only happens if both factors are met. When you're talking about corporate parties, the statute itself, the diversity statute 1332, defines jurisdiction as both the state of incorporation and the principal place of business. So a corporation can be a citizen of two different states, the state where it's incorporated and the principal place of business. How do you figure out the principal place of business? So in your chapter, you're reading the Hertz case, right? This was actually a, an issue that was much in dispute until relatively recently. But in Hertz, the Supreme Court says that the principal place of business is where the nerve center of the corporation is. And note that this is one of those rare and beautiful times that the Supreme Court uh, justices were unanimous in an opinion. Okay, so the nerve center is where the headquarters is. That's the principal place of business. All right, so note this, the opponent to the corporation, in order to have complete diversity, must be from a different state than both the corporation's state of incorporation and its principal place of business. So that means, let's think about this for a second. If I'm from Arizona and I slip and fall at a Walmart and I want to sue Walmart in federal court, then I have to be diverse from both Walmart's principal place of business and from its state of incorporation. But if I'm from Arizona 
and Walmart's incorporated in Delaware and has its principal place of business in Arkansas, I'm cool, right? I can go to federal court if I want to because I'm from Arizona, which is a different state from both Delaware, where Walmart's incorporated, and Arkansas, where Walmart has its principal place of business. Okay, but remember the other requirement. I have to have $75,000 at stake. Okay, is that hard to do? Well, let's see. In my slip and fall case. Let's say I have medical bills of 20 grand, got lost wages of five grand. Uh-oh, gotta get to 75, right? So far I'm only at 25. Not gonna make it, but wait. There are categories of damages that we call sometimes soft damages, meaning there's no bright line number to attach to them. So with medical bills, we know exactly how much that is, right? We got the bills. With lost wages, we know exactly how much that is because we know how much work I missed and what I would have been paid. But there are categories of damages that you can't put a bright line number on necessarily, or at least not with any certainty, because we have to wait to see if a decision maker, a jury, is going to decide how much it's worth. So for example, pain and suffering. If I have pain and suffering in the amount of $50,001, then I'm over the $75,000 minimum. And there's no bright line way to calculate pain and suffering, but it's not unusual for uh, plaintiffs to ask for three times at least um, the amount of their medical bills. So that wouldn't be out of the range of um, reasonability for that. So another way to say that is say it's not that hard to get to 75000 in cases that are worth bringing at all. <laughs> okay. All right, so what if you have more than one claim in a single case or more than one plaintiff in a single case? When can you add up those claims to get to $75,000? We call these the aggregation rules. And here they are. A single plaintiff can aggregate, put together, add up, all their claims against a single defendant. But multiple plaintiffs cannot add up or aggregate claims against a single defendant. A single plaintiff cannot aggregate claims against multiple defendants. But, and here's where it gets good, this is a little of a preview of coming attractions. If one plaintiff has a claim against a defendant worth more than 75000 Additional diverse plaintiffs whose claims are worth less can bring their claims under supplemental jurisdiction. Don't worry about that yet. We'll talk about that um, in the coming days. All right. But here we're going back to hypo hell. That's right. It's going to get hot. Hypo hell. Some more questions for you to answer yes or no and bring to class. All right. What I want you to do is answer these questions yes or no. Does diversity jurisdiction exist under Section 1332? Question 1. Plaintiff from Arizona sues defendant from Arizona for $100,000 to recover for a car accident, which is a state law tort claim. Diversity jurisdiction in federal court or no? Yes or no? Question 2. Plaintiff from Arizona sues defendant from Arizona Oh, sorry, plaintiff from Arizona sues defendant from California for $50,000, $50,000 to recover for a car accident, a state law tort claim. Diversity jurisdiction, yes or no? Number three, plaintiff from Arizona sues two defendants. One is from Arizona and one is from California, seeking $100,000 from each for a car accident claim. And then number four. Two plaintiffs, both from Arizona, sue defendant from California to recover for a car accident. Each plaintiff seeks $100,000. And then number five. Two plaintiffs, both from Arizona, sue a defendant from California to recover for a car accident. Each plaintiff seeks $50,000. 
So each of these questions you should be answering yes or no. Does diversity jurisdiction exist? You can do this. Just use the statute. It's all about the statute. Section 1332. Got to have complete diversity. Got to have the 75 grand at stake. Use the aggregation rules I just showed you and answer these questions yes or no and bring them to class. Okay. All right. Oh, our time is coming to an end. This has been so lovely. Let's talk about some key takeaways from what we've learned. Number one key takeaway, and this is huge. Federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. They cannot hear just any old case. They have to have power to hear the case under the federal constitution. And for a federal district court, a federal trial court to take a case, Congress must have passed a statute that allows it. The two most important types of cases Congress allows federal district courts to hear are federal question cases under 1331 and diversity cases under 1332. The Supreme Court interprets 1331 as including the Motley Well Pleaded Complaint Rule, meaning the federal question has to be part of plaintiff's cl claim, has to be cl plaintiff's claim and not come up just by way of defense. And the Supreme Court interprets Section 1332 to include the complete diversity rule, meaning that all plaintiffs have to be from a different state than all defendants. Notice that the Supreme Court has done this even though neither uh, rule appears in the text of the statutes. So you have to know the statutes and the way the Supreme Court has interpreted them. Okay, preview of coming attractions. Woo! This is where it gets really good. We're going to talk next week about supplemental jurisdiction or what is the thing, the thing, this federal court has power over. So if you think of a case as a pie, how appropriate, a pie with whipped cream. Um, so the case may include several different claims. Um, it may include uh, some federal claims and some state law claims. So what if you have federal jurisdiction over the federal claims, but you wouldn't have it over the state law claims? So we have to divide them up and take part of the claims to federal court, court and part to state court? Well, that seems kind of dumb. Or is there a way we can bring the whole thing together? We'll talk about next week. But in the meantime, keep calm, study on, and I've got one more little project for you, which is... A quick little essay, and this is really straightforward. Don't get uh, hung up on spending a lot of time on this because you should be able to answer this just given what we've talked about so far. This is a little practice essay um, for federal question jurisdiction that you should be able to IRAC in just literally a few sentences. Um, so read this question write out a quick, seriously, no more than 10 sentence at the, out at the most um, essay and bring that with you to class um, as well. And that way I know that you will have listened, cared, and practiced what you've learned from this online class. So I wish you all the happiest of holidays and I will See you soon.